Still everything? A voice asks on a wiretap phone. Yeah, everything's still everything. The other voice replies back. It's the evening of September 14th, 2004 in ATL, Georgia, and a joint task force of local, state, and federal agents working the high-intensity drug trafficking area designated as Atlanta has a bead on a couple of guys. Little do they know it'll lead them up all the way into helping be a part of cracking the Black Mafia family. Math is on everybody's mind, especially with this Stars TV show on. And we all know how the case played out that at the top end. T and Meech got 30 years in prison. T was lucky to get out uh, recently. Welcome home, salute to him. Meech still looks like he has about another, I don't know, eight to 10 years left. And uh, perhaps stars will go into the events in this story when they get into season two or three. But I thought it's important to look at what happens in the middle, what happens in between you're getting money and you get 30 years in prison. How does a small case like these guys on the wiretap help lead to the downfall of real kingpin? So the feds are listening to a guy named Rafel Smurf Allison on the phone asking his connect, is everything still everything? And the guy says, everything's still everything. That means you got some dope. The answer is yes. Well, whoever that guy was gets off the phone and within 10 minutes, he calls somebody else and asks him the same thing. Is everything still everything? Everything's still everything. So some small guys, I think we're going to cop some ounces, call the guy who maybe bought a kilo or something at a time, and then he calls somebody else to recop. The guy who was copping on the sm small end was named Bowlegs, and Bowlegs had called Smurf, but Smurf called the guy named DeCarlo Hoskins, and DeCarlo Hoskins was an MBMF, but he was copping from somebody that was definitely tied in with BMF. Interesting and disturbing sometimes when you look up people's names from cases way back and see what's going on with them now to try to figure out if they went to prison or something. Shout out to GTD, get the dough. Um, Smurf Allison is in Georgia State Prison right now, not for cocaine charges, though he did have some of those, but he got a long term for M-O-L-E-S activities with C-H-I-L-R-D-R-E-N's. Um, and here's a picture of him back in the early 2000s when this case happened. And then here's a picture of him now in the Georgia State Prison. Time has not been kind to Smurf. And uh, he came on our radar when he was trying to cop a couple zips from Bowlegs. And it looks like pretty much his life has been spent in custody since then as well as should be for uh, doing things with KIDSs that nobody is supposed to. Now back to our story. Now the high intensity drug trafficking area uh, task force I mentioned, the HIDTA, it's set up in not all major cities but hub cities, cities with a lot of uh, drug trafficking. Uh, Atlanta, New York, San Diego, Detroit, it's in quite a few cities and it and it brings a lot of federal resources to bear and basically they just set up and try to get intelligence on whoever they can and piece them together to build big cases. So this guy Smurf pulls out of his apartment complex and he gets tailed by the feds because he's just uh, said what they probably think is going to be a drug deal. Is everything, everything, he, he pulls out and they follow him. And he goes and he picks up something uh, from a guy on Howell Mill Road. And it only takes two days for a Fulton County judge to grant a request to wiretap the phone that the guy Smurf had been calling, DeCarlo Hoskins on Howell Mill Road. Three days of listening to DeCarlo Hoskins proved fruitful. It sounded as if DeCarlo was about to do a big deal with three guys. He told them over the phone to meet him at the spot. The feds took that to mean his own apartment and they were right. So the feds set up and wait. They were looking for a gray Nissan Altima with three guys to pull up and it did. According to their phone conversation, the guy's plan was to pick up whatever they were buying in this gray Altima and then go to the Georgia Superdome whether to, to watch a Falcons game, I think, before they went and took uh, what they were copping wherever they were going. And sure enough, 
at about 12.30, little after noon, they pull into the apartment complex in a gray Altima, three deep. Two minutes after they pulled in, a black Infinity pulls in, driven by DeCarlo Hoskins, the target of the investigation at this point. One of the guys hops out of the Altima and into the Infinity. A few minutes later, he gets back in the Altima and both cars dip. The Altima heads down Howell Mill Road with the agents in slow pursuit. They travel south toward Northside Drive, maneuvering through the game day traffic that snaked toward the Georgia Dome. Uh, the feds radioed for an Atlanta police car to intercede and pull him over. As soon as the patrol car flashed its lights, the guy in the Altima's passenger seat called to Carlo Hoskins. He said they were about to be pulled over and that he was going to flee and elude before he got caught with whatever they had just copped. Carlo Ho Hoskins told him to keep calm but keep the car in drive in case they had to go. Atlanta PD flicks him, but despite all the wild talk, they pull over. They don't even try to run, they don't argue, they don't put up a fight. There's a 357 Magnum sitting them on the floor of the car in plain view, which gives the police grounds to start searching the car. And of course, in the trunk, there's a Louis Vuitton tote bag, and wrapped up inside of it is seven slabs, a yayo, and then there's another shopping bag with two more bricks of the yams. Down at HIDTA headquarters, the men refused to talk, but agents didn't need them to. The high-intensity drug trafficking uh, task force already had enough evidence to take down their supplier, the Carlo Hoskins, the guy in the black infinity. When agents picked him up less than a month later and charged him with trafficking cocaine, the Carlo got to talking quickly. Perhaps that's why, as you can see from this, charge sheet of his admission in the Georgia State Prison. He got 15 years, but it looks like he only did three or something. He said he knew about a crew selling large quantities of coke up and down Boulevard. Boulevard is a street and I guess also like a neighborhood in central Atlanta. Used to be known for a lot of drug activity, I guess at one time, supposedly the Boulevard neighborhood had the most Section 8 housing of any area in the Southeast United States. Now, Mr. DeCarlo Hoskins was so kind to the feds as to tell him he knew two guys from childhood. They were involved in what was going on on Boulevard and that they were linked up with something called BMF and that he would even go so far as to call them for him. And he called a guy named O-Dog. And the feds already had this guy O-Dog on a list of people that was supposedly affiliated with BMF. And I think by this time there was the BMF billboard was hanging over I-75 and the BMF name was on the radar as a rap label and, and they were starting to want to build a case against these guys. So DeCarlo Hoskins calls up O-Dog and let that be a lesson to you. A lot of these guys running around out here doing whatever, like you see guys that seem fearless, it's because they already got a plan. They're planning to tell and they got a mental Rolodex of who to tell on. So don't be on somebody's mental Rolodex. So DeCarlo Hoskins, he's in custody and he calls O-Dog's phone, Omari McCree, and says, I want to get two blocks if you got anything. But Omari wasn't talking on the phone anymore and he told him that and hangs up. But that wasn't exactly true. In the weeks to come, as DeCarlo Hoskins tried to work him more and more, he did start talking on the phone. The weekend after DeCarlo's call, Omari wasn't doing the best job of staying out of trouble himself. He and his friend Jeffrey Lear, the two were so close, everyone assumed they were brothers, were hanging out at one of the hot clubs of the moment, the atrium, when they got shot up. Four people were shot, luckily no one was killed. O-Dog and Jeff Lear were suspects in it, and they got pulled in for questioning. And in another part of the Atlanta metropolitan sprawl, Big Meech himself was about to face questioning for some of the other violence that was starting to swirl around uh, the Black Mafia family, they weren't just blowing money fast, there was starting to be shootings piling up. Not long after Omari and Jeff were questioned for shooting up the atrium, Meech was arrested at a roadblock, but didn't have anything to say. Those close to Meech would later say he suspected the shootings at the atrium, and Omari and Jeff in particular were part of the reason he'd been hauled in. He knew one thing for sure though, BMF was starting to be public enemy number one on law enforcement's radar down in Georgia. 
Meech had tried to say his name was Rico Seville and gave a fake ID. But after the boys figured out who he actually was, he was charged for giving a false name police and carrying a fake license. And the next day, which was October 22nd, 2004, he got let out of jail. At the same time, the feds were initiating a series of wiretaps on Old Dog's phone. So remember, DiCarlo Hoskins gave Old Dog's name and called him about getting two blocks when he got brought in and they already knew he was affiliated with BMF, so they get some uh, wiretaps going on Omari McCree's phone. The wiretaps revealed that Omari was a member of BMF's sort of Atlanta upper echelon in terms of how much he was moving and that Meech was particularly fond of him. The boss, dude, as Omari and others called him, liked to talk to Omari directly. Shortly after 4 p.m., a woman whom investigators believed was Meech's personal assistant told Omari that both of them needed to be careful about the flashiness of their cars. I ain't trying to be no hater, she said. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but take your car home and just park it and don't do any extra driving. You got pending stuff. You know it ain't worth it with everything that's going on. Lay low. And then later she called him back to complain about the fact that it was going to be hard for her to pick Meech up from jail because she didn't even have anything low-key to go pick him up in. She wanted a Honda Accord or something and they didn't have any Honda Accords. For the rest of the evening, Amari would be taking calls about uh, the incident at the atrium. Quote, I'm just calling to make sure you guys were all right, one woman said. I had heard some stuff, something about some shooting stuff at the atrium. This is what different girls were calling in and saying. And uh, somebody said, I heard they got Meech and them on some other stuff. And that meant the arrest of Meech at the roadblock coming out of pinups in another part of Atlanta. And then people were talking about something called the gate. A woman told them the gate was closed or the gate was not open and about something called the elevators. In fact, Meech's assistant said, uh, the boss wants your ass to drive your car over to the elevators. Now, if you're confused about what the gate and the elevators were, well, now that's pretty interesting. Meech, uh, Meech, uh, some of the stuff he did, you know, was pretty, pretty smart, but simple. Um, of course, when you're running a big organization, you need places to meet, keep places to stash stuff, places to get money, places to hide things, safe houses. And they had a lot of mansions scattered around, uh, mansions, condos, different things scattered around Atlanta. And of course, you know, you know how it goes. For those of you that have ever done a mid-level drug deal, somebody might tell you, meet you on the corner and you meet him at some gas station and you follow him real fast and you don't, you sort of know where you're at, but not really. And then in Atlanta, where there's a lot of the neighborhoods, different neighborhoods look different. There's a lot of hills, there's wooded areas. Uh, they had these kind of mini mansions stashed around and the elevator was one that had, I think, four floors. So it had an elevator, the gate had some big gate, I guess you went in. There was one called Space Mountain. I think Cavario talked about one of his stories where he would go, which was just like a hangout house. It was called the kitchen because they would all hang out in the big kitchen and smoke weed and talk. And uh, so Amari has been summoned to the elevator uh, after Meech's release after about a day in jail. He had been picked up uh, leaving pinups, tried to give his name as Rico Seville and was charged with uh, giving false identification. And he's a little bit Maybe he's not quite mad yet at Omari, but he wants to see what's going on. So 1 a.m., Meech's assistant calls Omari. What up? She says, your boss said, have your ass at the elevator. He says, he act like I did something wrong. And Omari kind of laughed, but all right. But he wouldn't be laughing long. She said, he's filling out paperwork right now. He ain't talking on the phone, meaning Big Meech. Means he wants to see people in person. And he wanted to see him at the elevator. So that's where Omari went to. But of course, at this point, Omari's on the HIDTA, the federal radar. And as he pulls out in his silver Porsche SUV, the feds are on him. And uh, they, they follow him. They've been stationed outside of Omari's house. They've been listening to his calls. 
So the address of the elevator wasn't said, but they know they can probably follow him to somewhere where Big Meech considers uh, a, a safe house. So they follow him out of Omari's neighborhood onto North Druid Hills Road, then onto Roxboro, and from there onto Wyeka. At that point, Omari's driving really fast. Maybe he thought he was being followed and the agents couldn't keep up or they didn't want to keep up to blow their cover that they're following him. In the days to come, though, agents would continue to gather intelligence on the situation. They learned from listening to Omari's calls that BMF insiders, like maybe j -Bo, had begin, begun to suspect that Omari McCree was bringing some heat to BMF. And Omari himself appeared to be concerned. I mean, he did owe him. The woman presumed to be Meech's assistant, I think it's the, the young lady, Juice, who died not too long ago, made it clear to Omari that uh, Meech had high hopes for him. And Omari, in turn, said he was worried about the atrium shootings. He told others that he was worried about De Carlo's bus, too. So probably word on the grapevine is that the squeeze might be on him and that he thought he was being followed. And of course, I'm sure Meech didn't want to hear that because remember that DeCarlo Hoskins was brought in after the guys in the Ultima were caught with nine bricks and that all started with the Smurf Allison guy. And then they called, uh, named O-Dog and Jeff Lear as suppliers, even trying to get them to incriminate themselves on the phone, which he really hadn't done, though he did talk to Hoskins. Now, a few days after the meeting at the elevator, uh, the woman called again, and this time it sounded like her mood had changed a little bit. Quote, dude just ask me how is everybody, she said. I'm telling him everybody is cool, but they need to just sit tight. Meech says, shit, everybody's just got to sit in. You got to all take care of that energy you're using to mope around and do something productive and get on with your lives. Now, did that mean they were about to cut ties with them? I don't know. She tells Omari, you're in a good position right now. You're in a good position. So what's going on here? Sounds like maybe Meech knows Omari's getting hot and he's telling them, Stay away from me. Get on with your life. I don't know. Does that mean keep get back selling dope? I doubt it because things are getting hot in a lot of ways for Big Meech down in Atlanta at this point. And I would imagine he heard someone that Omari sold to, Hoskins, might be compromised, which he was. Uh, Omari feels like he's being followed, which he was. And... Omari and others are worried about Omari's involvement in the shooting at the atrium, which he probably was. So I don't think he was ever convicted of it. I appreciate all the care, Omari McCree said back, perhaps sarcastically. I appreciate everything for real from everybody and whatever. But when it's all said and done, I'm the one who's got to deal with it. Yeah, you, he was right about that. If they want O, they come in to get O. I'm still the one that's got to deal with the problems at the end of the day. Maybe I'm preparing myself for the worst. So it seems like he's pretty shook. And now we get to the real bad part where Omari and Jeffrey Lear's ability to literally secure the bag, the literal bag, is so poor that everything goes totally off the rails and into disaster mode. So Meech is sort of pressing Omari, one of his golden children, to kind of stay away. Who knows how many bricks Omari had flipped for the family. Maybe it was very valuable. As far as I know, he was not in any BMF indictment. But I couldn't find his name nor his partner Jeffrey Lear's name, uh, despite being marked as a BMF member early on. I couldn't find their names in Georgia State Prison or in federal prison. Hmm. We will get back to that. So about another week later, Omari got suspicious about a black truck that's been lingering around in front of the house he shared with Jeffrey Lear, where they're keeping stuff at. And uh, so Lear gets the bright idea to calm Omari down by, uh, well, the idea was he had a girlfriend named Courtney Williams, and Williams was out of town, so Jeffrey Lear offers to bring the clothes to her apartment out of his in Omari's crib. Now, the clothes, of course, was kilos of coke. 
And Omari says, yeah, let's do it. They were going to take the bricks they had on consignment from Meech out of Omari and Lear's uh, crib and move them over to Jeffrey's girlfriend's apartment, unbeknownst to her. So Jeffrey takes the clothes over to her apartment that day. But when he called his girlfriend the day after that, she told him she wanted the clothes out of there. Courtney was not down with using her apartment to store BMF dope. And in fact, she was at the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport all of a sudden, she informed him, and she was only planning to be in town a short while before heading back out, and she didn't want that stuff over there. Quote, I'm sick of this dirty business, Courtney told him. So I'm just trying to figure out if you're going to be there within the next 30 minutes because I'm about to go out of town. Jeffrey Lear says, well, can I keep your key while you're out of town? He's pleading with her. She says, can you keep my key? No, you can't keep my key. Courtney, please, I need to keep those clothes over there for real. You don't even understand right now. And she says, you're right. I don't understand. Well, can I just keep the clothes over here? No, and you can't keep my key. So they're sitting over in this apartment. They have what turns out to be 10 kilos of cocaine, who they owe probably $200,000 to BMF Big Meach for. They already feel like they're getting followed. The girlfriend's in town like, I want that stuff out of there now. So what happens? Courtney told Jeffrey she'd take a cab over to his and Omari's place from the airport. But the feds were watching everything since everybody's phones were tapped and they knew what was going to happen. And they watched as a peach cab company pulled into the gate of subdivision and Courtney Williams stepped out. Ten minutes later, she left Omari and Jeffrey's house in a white Cadillac. Uh, a few minutes passed before Jeffrey sped away from the house in the Porsche. And uh, federal agents, who included the DEA this time, divided into two teams and took off after the two cars. The Porsche was Jeff driving wildly. That was the one Jeffrey Lear and uh, was driving. He ran a light on Spring Street and agents lost him. The girl, Courtney Williams, was easier to keep up with. Agents followed her all the way to her apartment, I guess, I think in the Boulevard area. And it turned out that losing the tail on the Porsche was no big deal because a few minutes later, Jeffrey pulled up to the same apartment building. They were both going to Courtney Williams' place and they went inside. And shortly after a few minutes, they come out of Courtney's apartment with the duffel bag and the feds are sitting there watching it all. They climb into the Porsche and they head toward the highway. They're moving the clothes. And uh, so at this point, they get pulled over. Omari McCree's not there. He starts calling the phone. Jeffrey Lear's answering the phone from the back of the police car saying, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. Uh, they got 10 kilos of cocaine from them. The Courtney Williams girl is crying. Remember, they kind of roped her into this, though I'm sure she didn't mind spending the money that her boyfriend Jeffrey was making, but she did clearly say, don't hide any 10 kilos at my house. But then she stupidly went to help him move the stuff back out of her house. They get flicked. She's crying. Jeffrey Lear is not ready to take the weight. Nobody is. So a little while later, the feds take them inside Courtney's apartment and with her permission, they search the place. I don't know if they found some more stuff or they had it all. And then the police let them go which was unusual, but investigators figured Jeff and Courtney would keep talking on the phone because they were so dumb, and that might yield even better information. Quote, everything just went wrong, oh, Courtney continued calling Omari. Just leave the house, all right? Telling him to get out of the house him and Jeffrey Lear had. Uh, well, as long as you left the house, you should be straight. Omari says, would you stop? Look, just tell me what happened. And she says, I don't want to talk on the phone. Well, they had just gotten released by the feds and they took 10 kilos. Now, at some point, I think it was in the aftermath of this incident, but I'm not exactly sure when, but sometime around this, something else happened with Omari. He started talking to the feds and it's on record. An agent handed him a confidential source agreement form and told him that if he would answer some questions, the district attorney's office would be made aware of his cooperation. 
Omari signed it, and the agent started asking him questions. Quote, are you familiar with BMF? I learned about BMF back in 1999, Omari answered. They weren't called BMF at the time. In 1999, whom did you know as members of BMF? Omari said, I only knew uh, Meech and Blue Da Vinci. Quote, when did you become a part of BMF? Omari says, in 2002, after meeting Meech's son at a birthday party in Florida. Quote, have you ever heard of the elevator? Answer, yes. Where is the elevator located? On Glen Ridge. Investigators were never able to determine the exact location of the elevator, uh, though it was clear from the wiretaps that it was a BMF meeting place. As for the next location the agent asked about, it too was described in the wiretaps, and investigators already knew where it was. They'd staked it out before. Quote, have you ever heard of the gate? Answer, yes. Where's the gate located? Off of Roswell Road near the Chevron. Quote, have you ever purchased or obtained drugs from the gate? And Omari McCree says, yes. How did you obtain the drugs? I would call j and then I would go and pick it up. Where would you pick it up? At the gate. Quote, would anyone be there when you arrived? Yes, j -Bo. Who's j -Bo? He works for He works for Dude. Who is Dude? Dude is Big Meech, a.k.a. Demetrius Flannery. Who's responsible for the drugs getting to the gate? Big Meech. How much have you seen while at the gate? About 50 keys. Would you be willing to show me where the gate is located, the feds ask. Man, I ain't talking no more. These people know my family. Well, it was a little late for that. And Omari's next words hinted at the fact that he thought he'd get off easier than he would, but I don't know how he got off. Will I walk, he asked. No, they answered. But again, I've scoured through all the records. I can't find his or Jeffrey Lear's name as having served any time anywhere. And I think somebody told me they saw him bopping around Atlanta, you know, sometimes in these cases, because there was hundreds of indictments in BMF. There was multiple overlapping indictments. Maybe he gave this info and never had to get on the stand and never ended up getting charged because they didn't need him. He kind of fell through the cracks. I don't know. Can't find any record of Jeffrey Lear or Omari McCree going to prison, but maybe they did. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, So that was the anatomy of just one part of the case against them, how it started off with <laughs> a little rinky-dink dealer who now is in prison for fooling with K kids, uh, trying to buy some maybe a half a key, and then that led to the guy who sold a few keys, and then that guy said, yeah, I know who a BMF member is. They start following them. They're just wiretapping people from knowing who they talk to. They, they don't have a good place to stash it. See, Meech and them were moving their keys all the time and never had any problems. But Lear and Omari had it at their house, then they want to stick it at a girlfriend's house. They're driving it here, they're driving it there. And uh, they folded under questioning pretty quick. As everyone in this little chain of events did from DiCarlo Hoskins on up. So uh, obviously they weren't the only uh, thing that brought Meech down. In fact, I'm sure this was a very small part of the piece of the puzzle, but kind of scary. I mean, you can be out here rocking and rolling at a high level for a long time and just a few people's mistakes and a few people's unwillingness to take any weight like they were talking to the feds they didn't even ask for lawyers they just immediately started talking so set your own risk al profit bmf american dope